Good morning, Evangel. It is great to see you all here this morning. We are excited that you are here to worship at this gathering at Evangel Community Church with us here today. A special welcome and shout out to everybody out on Facebook land. We are glad that you guys are joining us virtually as well. If you have any questions out there, we've got somebody monitoring the chat so you can say hey and what's up and uh, ask any questions that you might have and we'll be uh, just happy to connect with you. Before we begin our worship this morning, we are going to read out of Psalm chapter 68 and verses 34 through 35. Proclaim the power of God, whose majesty is over Israel, whose power is in the heavens. You, God, are awesome in your sanctuary. The God of Israel gives power and strength to his people. Praise be to God. And that's what we're here to do together this morning. So before we worship God, would you guys bow your heads and pray with me? Father, we come before you and we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are an awesome God. And we thank you that you are a powerful God. And we ask that you would meet us here in this space and in this place this morning as we gather together in the name of Jesus. God, we pray that you would hear our praises and that we would bring you honor and glory as we worship you together this morning in this gathering. It's in Jesus' precious and holy and mighty name that we pray these things. Amen. Please stand with us and worship this morning.
Thanks, worship team. You can have a seat. And we're going to run through announcements real quick. As always, uh, we uh, encourage social distancing. And this is first service, so masks are required. So we ask that you would do that as well. Um, and we ask that you give room for the Spirit to move on that. Go ahead and grab your cell phones, pull them out, and you can take a picture of the QR code behind me for notes and lyrics and all that good stuff. And we'll be using those phones throughout the announcements. And uh, the big thing that I want you to do is text 906-233-6611 and text either new here or share. If you're new here, this is a way that we can get to know you a little bit better and uh, we'll get in contact you, uh, with you after you text us new. If you're here, you're an attender, you've been here for a while, this just lets us know that you're hanging around with us and that kind of thing. And then share. Uh, if you have a prayer request that you'd like to share or an update to, to some information and that kind of thing, that's the way that you can inform us of that. Well, we like to talk about uh, giving during this time. And uh, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and uh, all these things will be added to you. And so if, if we want peace, if we want fulfillment in our lives, we have to seek the Father's kingdom first. Uh, that doesn't mean we can't seek anything else or that we can't have any ambition, uh, but it's about priority. If we seek God's kingdom first, he promises to, to bless us and, and to be with us. And giving is just a practical way of putting God's kingdom first. So there's a number of different ways to give, and you can see that on the screen. You can always mail us a check. You can put a, a check or something in the offering box in the back. You can go to our website and, and click on the Give button, and you can use your phones to text ECH Give to 77977. Well, we're starting a new sermon series this morning, and uh, we'll be looking at the end of the world as we know it. Uh, but we have hope, and we're looking at Revelation, we're looking at the promises of Jesus, we're looking at how great Jesus is. So that's going to be exciting this morning. Well, want to make sure that everyone is aware of our two services. The first one is uh, a mask required, the second one is masks recommended. So if you have friends that you want to invite them to come on out, uh, we want to take that uh, obstacle away. And so whichever they prefer, they can come to one of those services. Uh, I have an announcement for MOPS. This is Mothers of Preschoolers. And uh, MOPS will be starting in person on Tuesday, October 13th. And they meet from 915 to 1115. And so to register for that, you go online to Evangel UP dot org slash mops and you can register for that if you have any questions you can contact janet stewart she is the director of mops and you can contact her mops at evangelup.org and our kids ministry is starting up next week so on october 4th uh, we'll be having kids stuff and we already have some stuff during our first service it's uh, our kids kind of do a, like a children's church after worship time and, and that kind of thing. A mask required for that. In second service, there'll be a full Sunday school available, and uh, that will, will be, you can check in for that and that kind of stuff. We'll give more details and, and that kind of thing, so be following us on our social media stuff. Uh, but we want to make sure our kids know the certainty of our God, and so uh, we're starting those up next week, and uh, be on the lookout for more info on it. We have our kids volunteer uh, gathering and training after services this morning. Lunch will be provided. We're going to meet in the warehouse room. So just to uh, your left, my right. And yeah, so if you're interested in serving in kids ministry, you can come on out for that. Also, Men's 33 is starting up this week. And this is our, our men's gathering uh, where we talk about what it means to, to be men and challenge each other to grow. And we'll have a hot breakfast. Well, maybe not hot, but we'll have some kind of breakfast and food. And coffee will be hot, so come on out for that on Thursday. And then we have an evangel class. And this is how you get to know a little bit more about who we are as a church. And you can sign up for that by texting evangel to 906-233-6611. And this is going to be October 11th. Lunch will be provided from 12.30 to 2, so if you are looking to become a member, that's your, your first step to membership, too. All right, well, that's it for the announcement, so go ahead and stand for me, and let's continue to worship our Lord.
had kids, you can go over to the live studio audience for our children's ministry. Uh, It's good to be with you this morning. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are a good, good God that loves us so much. Uh, God, we just ask that you would meet us here today, that you would meet us as we, as a community, open uh, your word. And uh, when we do that, God, uh, you, this particular book, you tell us that we will be blessed. And we ask for that blessing today in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're starting a new series. It's the end of the world as we know it. And I have hope. This, this series has been born out of uh, emails and conversations that I've had with many of you. And it's a good question. Is this really the end of the world? Uh, we have pandemics, or pandemic one, I guess. Uh, we have racial unrest. We have political foundations being shaken. Uh, did you know that there's a... Um, there's a, a plague in, in Africa, a locust plague in Africa. Did you know this? And uh, here's a picture. Look at this guy. He looks like he's having fun. I'd be freaking out, but he looks like he's having a good time. Uh, but uh, it's, it's there. And so there's, there's some uh, backdrop of this that we are, are working through in the idea of, is this really the end of the world? Um, these locusts, they can eat... Um, uh, 80 million locusts can devour enough food to feed about 35,000 people. They can do that one day. And so you start thinking when you look at this famine, right? Um, well, if it's the end of the world, what do we do? That becomes the next question. And so remember back in 2011, there was a guy by the name of Harold Camping. And uh, he was the guy who was, had a radio station. He wrote a couple books. And he said it's the end of the world. And uh, he said that May 20, did anybody remember this? May 21, 2011. And so he, the problem with it is that he got it wrong, right? Uh, if you didn't know that, he got it wrong. Um, we're still here. Uh, he, but he predicted uh, May 7th in uh, 1994, and he's like, oh, my calculations were a little bit off and, and whatnot. Then he said May 21st, and then he said October 21st. And... Uh, he was wrong. Um, so he was wrong, right? Uh, like, he, he, he did not know the time. Um, some of you have probably saw this. And, and remember in 2012, the Mayan calendar? And uh, the Mayan calendar, people were worried about this because it predicted the end of the world would be December 21st of, of 2012. And so some of you probably went on the World Wide Web, looked up some of those things, and, and were trying to figure out, is this really true? And maybe some of you were a little nervous. Uh, we will make you raise your hands if you did that. Um, and so the question that we wrestle with is, when is the end of the world? Here, here it is. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know when the world's going to end. You know why I don't know? Because even the sun doesn't know. Jesus didn't know. And you look in Matthew, it talks about this, and uh, Jesus is speaking, and uh, he said, no one knows about the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was written the days of Noah, so it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in a field, one will be taken, and the other left. So it, it goes on, and it says two women will be grinding with a handmill, one will be taken, and the other left. Therefore, keep watch, this is the important part, keep watch, because you don't know on what day your Lord will come. So to answer that question, if somebody says to you, hey, I know the day of the second coming of Christ, I would question that a bit. I would question that a bit. But what, what our job is, is to really keep watch. Um, I, and I'm not sure that it's all about, in this, in this idea, it's not all about looking at the signs and going, Okay, let's do the calculations. Let's figure this thing out. Um, Jesus tells us he's coming back. He's coming back. If you've met Jesus, if you're following Jesus, um, then you're, in a sense, keeping watch. 
you're ready for the end of the world. Think about this for just a second. Um, every generation has thought Jesus was coming back. Every generation. Every generation believed that their generation was the generation that Jesus was coming back. Guess how many generations get to be right? One, right? One. So we might be the one, um, but here's what I do know for certain. Uh, nobody in this room is going to see um, 20, 1, 20. Um, none of us are. We're all going to die, right? We're going to die. And here's the deal. What does the Apostle Paul say about that? Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Pretty good deal. Pretty good deal, right? That's a good deal. If Jesus comes or you die, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've said yes to Jesus, it's awesome, right? It's good. It's really good. And so I don't think it's about doing these elaborate calculations to try to figure it out because not even the sun knows. It's really about being obedient. It's really about going, man, I, I want to live for the King of Kings today. And, and whether he comes today or whether he comes in 10,000 years, it doesn't really matter because I'm prepared. Whether I live today or I die tomorrow, it doesn't really matter because he's good and I'm connected to him. And it's his righteousness, not my righteousness. But at the same time, we are seeing signs. We're seeing signs of, of the time, and, and the book of Revelation talks about these things. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about the, about the book of Revelation, and uh, it, it talks over and over again uh, about different things that are kind of scary and kind of crazy, and you're kind of like, what's going on in this whole thing? But let me assure you, the book of Revelation was written for one purpose— to give us hope. It's a hope. It's a book of hope. If you are a believer in Jesus, this is an incredible book of hope. Here's why it's a book of hope for the believer. Because the Bible says that at the end of time, Jesus is going to come back and he's going to make all things right. He's going to make all things right. And if you're on team Jesus, all things are going to be made right. If it's not right right now, it's because Jesus hasn't, isn't done with it yet. So whether Jesus comes back in our lifetime or you go to sleep, the Bible's way of talking about believers passing away, it's good. It's good. Here's what the Bible says about the end times in Revelation. If you're a follower of Jesus, fear not. Fear not. That's what it says. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, nobody knows the end time. Nobody knows the day. Nobody knows the hour. Nobody knows the minute. Nobody knows this thing except the Father. So our job is to live for Jesus. Our job is to love Jesus. Our job is to worship Jesus. Our job is to encourage others to do the same. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Revelation. Apocalypse is the Greek word. And uh, it, it's, this is what it means. It means revelation, disclosure, or unveiling of, of heavenly or future realities. Here's, you need to know that. It's an unveiling of a couple of things. It's an unveiling of heavenly or future realities. As we walk through this series, you're going to need to understand there's a guy by the name of John. He's on a, a, a island called Patmos, and he, he, he hears this voice, and, and it's, almost, it, it's almost like the, the veil is opened, and he can see a different reality. He can see a spiritual reality. The Bible talks about this spiritual reality reality the, our battle is not against flesh and blood but there's the this principalities these 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 things that are happening that we can't see for this moment he gets to see it he gets to see what's happening in the heavenly realms and, and, and so he's seeing what's happening in his time but then he also gets to see kind of the end and what's happening in the end so it's not just about this unveiling of like this is these are the things that are going to happen it's it's both and it's both things that are happening there's both things being disclosed 
for John. John's understanding his own reality. He's also understanding that there's this future thing that's happening. So part of what's happening for John is his eyes are open in the book of Revelation, and he's able to see the spiritual reality that we can't see, and it's happening in his time. The other part is that it's this end time thing that he's seeing. He's seeing what's going to happen. The first thing that you need to know about the book of Revelation is this. The book of Revelation is about Jesus. It starts with Jesus, it ends with Jesus. He's the main character. It's about Jesus. It's always about Jesus, but this book is about Jesus. This is important to understand um, because Jesus is our hope. This is what we place our hope in. Um, and, and so there's a couple of things. If you're walking through this book and, and you start reading this thing, and you don't understand it's about Jesus and what Jesus is going to do, that he's the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He's the one that is in control of all things. And we, if you have your hope in him, it's a really good hope and it's a really good reality for you. Um, if you don't have that, what happens is you get really, really scared because there's some really, really re weird things in here. There's like sea monsters coming out. There's, there, there's horsemen coming in and you're like, what is this stuff? This is crazy. And you get really scared, and this is what happens. Um, you go to Costco, and you start buying a bunch of food. And you dig a big hole, and you get a bunch of ammunition, and you go, and you start prepping. That's what, that's what happens if you don't understand. This is about Jesus. This is about hope. This is for the church to understand the hope that they have in Jesus. You get weird if you don't understand that. So understand, it's about Jesus. Um, remember, John's trying to describe something that he has never seen before. And he's trying to put it into words. He doesn't know. He's opening up something that we haven't seen. And he's trying to describe it in words that we would understand. The book is it, it's truly, it's about all about Jesus and what he's going to accomplish Every tear, think about this, every tear is going to be wiped away. There is going to be no more death. There's going to be no more pain. There's going to be no more mourning. This is what this book is describing. It's a book of hope. King Jesus will wipe out all evil for all time. It's going to be great. If you're a follower of Jesus, this is a good thing. You don't need to be a prepper. You don't need to be a big you know, a big, big hole and learn to churn your own butter. You don't need to do that. So Revelation chapter 1. The revelation of Jesus which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. This is a revelation of Jesus. When we think of Jesus, we often think of Jesus 2,000 years ago, right? We think of the pictures that have been depicted of him, the artwork, and we think of this Jesus, nice hair, well-conditioned, holding a lamb, petting a lamb, right? This is what we think of when we think of King Jesus, and yet in this book, it's going to show you a little bit different picture of Jesus, it's a picture of glorified Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. It's a picture of him in his glory. How we, often, we don't think of him like this. We don't think of him as the Alpha, the Omega, this powerful being, the Messiah, the one who was anointed, that all things are under his feet. He's the one who's in control. We don't think of it, but that's what this book tells us about him. It looks very, very different, and we're going to get to that in just a moment. It's not lamb petting Jesus that the book of Revelation shows us. And it pushes us, I think, to worship Jesus in a totally different way. Jesus is the one who defeated death. He's the one who went to the cross, and it says that he died on the cross for you and for me. He, he didn't deserve to die, but he had this barrier between him and God in that, that moment where he, he, he goes, Father, why have you forsaken me? 
the darkness goes between. They've never been separated in all of eternity. In that moment, Jesus dies for you and for me. Not because he deserved it. But three days later, he rises from the dead. And he has the keys of of Hades. He has the keys of death because he defeated it. And you see him in Revelation in this great hope of who he is and what he's done already. He gives this to his servant, um, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending angels to his servant, John. So, well, who is John? Um, Let's talk just a little bit about that. John is... Uh, Jesus' best friend on earth, right? He's the the loved one. He's the one of the 12 disciples. There's 12 disciples, uh, three of them, they're really close to Jesus, Peter, James, and John. And uh, John, he's continued in the faith, continued believing in Jesus, continued to walk in faithfulness, and he's exiled to this island of Patmos. So John is on this island, and these angels come to him, and, and they reveal these events And uh, they open up his eyes to these two realities. Goes on in verse 2. And and it says, who testifies to everything he saw? That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of prophecy. Blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart to what is written. Because the time is near. talked about this a second ago but we don't need to be afraid of what's coming we don't need to be afraid of of the this book even though it seems scary and seems overwhelming when you're reading it late at night by yourself um it's scary right there's weird things happening here but it says if you read this guess what happens what do we get a blessing right so you came to church today and you're going to be blessed by being hearers of the word. I get to speak it. I'm going to be blessed by this. This is the promise of the book of Revelation. There's a blessing that happens in this. We're blessed if we read it. We're blessed if we hear it. We're blessed if we obey it. You might be asking, well, Levo, what, is it, what does it mean the time is near? Here's what it means. And blow your mind with this. It means the time is near. So we know Jesus was around about 2,000 years ago, and uh, Jesus was living, he was breathing, he was doing his ministry stuff, and they put him on the cross, and he died. And uh, this is coming out of the, he said he's coming back, and he told us that he was coming back. And and so we have this 2,000 years, and they're like, well, that's a really long time, right? That's a really, really, really long time. What does that mean that the time is near? If a doctor comes to you and said to you, like, hey, the time is near, the Bible, or the baby is coming, right? That could mean a few things, right? It could mean that the baby's coming in, like, 20 minutes. could mean, like, in two weeks. Um, But the time is near. When we think of time, we think of it very, uh, uh, like, a year, an hour. We think of it like that. But God doesn't think of it like that. The Bible talks about um, how God views time or how he sees time. And, and a, a day is like a thousand years for him. It's just different for him. It just, it's not the same for him as it is for us. So if you think about it like that, and if we were trying to calculate this thing out, it's been like two days. So calm down. The time is near, right? Jesus is coming. And we need to live in a way that we're ready to go. The time is near. The main character of the book of Revelation is what? Jesus. Number two thing. What's the intent of Revelation? What is he trying to do with the book of Revelation? Um, The intent is is this. It's to, to unify and to fortify the church. The goal of Revelation is not to stress you out. It's to strengthen you up. It's to strengthen us up, the church. The goal of Revelation is to fortify the church in their faith in Jesus Christ. That he's going to make all things right. 
He's the one who's in control. He's going to be the one who wins. Remember, John, the veil is being lifted. He's seeing things as they are in the, in the spiritual realm. In reality, if you read the book of Revelation and you don't understand it, it's about Jesus, um, it's going to freak you out. But if you understand that it's about Jesus, it's about fortifying the church and the hope that we have, it's going to comfort you. It's going to be a book of comfort. You would expect John, you know, these are things like he's seen sea monsters and he's seen horsemen and he's seen blood and he's seen guts and he's seen all these crazy things coming. He's seen the glory of Christ and he's coming and he's like, you know, at one point he bows down because he's scared. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But you would expect him to be scared out of his mind, freaked out of his mind. Like, what is going on here? Like, what's happening? But if you jump to Revelation chapter 22, verse 20, he who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. This is Jesus speaking. Amen. And then it says, come Lord Jesus. That's John. Come Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. This is John. He's not freaked out. He's like, man, this is awesome. This is good. This book is designed to fortify the church. We're going to read this in just a moment. But in the book, it talks about these seven lamps, these lampstands. Uh, this is the seven churches uh, of that time. And that's what it's referring to. The number seven is a, a number of completion in the scripture, in the Bible. He talks about the churches as a lampstand because the local church is the light of the world. It's the one who holds the message of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if there's a pandemic. It, it doesn't matter uh, if there's, there, there's things happening locally or globally. The message of the church is always the same. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He's the Savior. You're a man in a, or a woman in need of a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus. That's the message of the church. And, and it's the light of the world. Because what happens is this world is going to end at some point. And the church's job is to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, that there is hope. There is hope uh, after this life, if your life happens to end before the second coming of Christ, or if Jesus comes back, there's hope. The church cannot be stopped as it proclaims the gospel. Because the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, um, he's the groom, right? Or the bride, he's the groom. He's the one who's in control of, over all of this stuff. And, and he's saying, hey church, you keep proclaiming that. You keep doing this. This idea that we, um, we can't as a church, or we shouldn't as a church, if Jesus is calling us to do something, we do it. it it's not an option, right? Um, this book is to give us courage. They're going into a time of persecution. The church is going to go into a time of persecution in the time of John. And, and, and he, he's encouraging them to fortify their faith, to teach Jesus, to speak of his glory and his goodness, that he's coming again. So the main character is, the intent is to what? Unify the church. Strengthen the church. Unify the church. The theme of the book is worship. I want to challenge you in this series. We're only going to be in this for four weeks. Um, in this four weeks, read through the book of Revelation. Read through it. Just read through it and uh, uh, just read through this book and... and um, you'll get a blessing, it says, out of it. So read through it, and in every chapter, though, what you will see, almost every chapter, not every chapter, um, almost every chapter, the word throne comes up. It appears. 
a throne is something that connotes this idea of king, queen, right? Something that we, um, we look toward or we worship. Oftentimes, I think people, they get caught up in kind of the, the dot and tittles of, of, of Revelation, and they're trying to figure out this, and they're trying to figure out that, and they're trying to match it up over here in this world. And, and some of it is about this world, and some of it's about a heavenly world, and it's both. And, and they miss the point that it's about worship. It's about Jesus. The reality is, is that we're all worshiping something. And in your life, there's something sitting on the throne. The book of Revelation is pushing us to make sure that Jesus is on the throne of our lives. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you've said yes to Jesus, um, that, that Jesus is on the throne of your heart and on the throne of your mind. That we have Jesus on the throne of our finances. That we have Jesus on the throne of our relationships. We have uh, Jesus on the, the throne of our marriages. Is Jesus on the throne of every area of your life? And I think this is what this book pushes us toward. And Matthew, I said this before, um, that, that people get caught up in it. And it's not wrong to study this and look at these parts in it, in it and that's good. But sometimes we get so caught up that we miss the, the major themes of what it's trying to do for us, for the church. And Matthew chapter 25, Jesus says, you blind guides, you strain out the gnat and you swallow the camel. And I think that's sometimes what we do with the book of Revelation. It is, we're looking for this little, little secret knowledge. And we miss the beauty of it. We miss what's actually happening and the purpose of it. The purpose of Revelation is to say, hey, uh, Jesus, he's our hope. Church, you stand on, on, on the rock and uh, you stand on what he did for you and you proclaim what he did for you and you worship him and him alone. And, and when we start to see that, um, you be, start to become prepared for whatever happens. It doesn't matter if, if Jesus comes back tomorrow. It doesn't matter if you die tomorrow, if, those are, if that, that's what's on your throne. If Jesus is on your throne, it doesn't matter. The other part, I think, is it, it puts the church on mission. Here's the reality. Jesus is coming back. We don't know when. But the church should be on mission. You should be on mission. The proclamation of the gospel is very, very important. Um, if Jesus is coming back, there's a limited amount of time. The scriptures tell us that, that the Father wants no one to perish, so he, he, he's slow, or we think of him as slow to become angry, and, and he, he, he's slow for this process to happen, or what we would think is slow. But be assured, it's coming, right? But the reality is when Jesus comes back, what does that mean for your neighbor who doesn't know Jesus? It's not a good, that's not a good outcome, right? It's not a good outcome from, for, for auntie who doesn't know Jesus, right? And, and so in one sense, we go, well, thanks for being slow, God. Thanks for being slow. And yet we want you to come. There's a limited amount of time. And, and we need to be on mission as a church. We need to be speaking the gospel. You need to be speaking the gospel. There's going to come a time where it's too late. And yet, if, you're, if you've said yes to Jesus, you have the greatest treasure this world has ever known. You have salvation. You have a relationship with God because of what Jesus did for you. This is an incredible treasure that we should give away. Some of you would love for me to, to spend like nine months on this and walk through this, and we could do that. And we talk about the four horsemen and what they mean and try to figure it out. But we're not going to do that. We're going to spend about four weeks on this. We're going to give you a quick overview of this. And we're going to talk through this. Um, part of the reason is I don't want to get caught so much in the dot and tittles. I want to get caught in the beauty of this book and the beauty of who Jesus is and the beauty that he is coming again. I also want us to understand this. None of us are on the planning committee for Jesus' second coming. 
We're not on the planning committee. We weren't, we weren't voted on. There's only one on the planning committee. It's the father. That's it. But we are on the welcoming committee. We're on the welcoming committee. And we should be wanting to throw the biggest party ever. Right? The greatest party ever. Right? Your heart should be right with Christ. And you should be sharing, hey, Jesus is coming again. Hey, you need to know Jesus. You need to be come to the party because it's going to happen. It's going to happen. My biggest worry about the church is the unity of the church. Are we following King Jesus? Are we following King Jesus? My biggest worry is that are, are we on mission with Jesus? Are we, are we proclaiming the gospel? Are we truly on this welcoming committee? I'm going to say something that's going to offend some of you. and Oh well, it is what it is. Don't shoot the messenger, I guess. Every Monday morning, I get the opportunity to open up the complaint department. It's called my computer. And I know some of you are worried about masks, and some of you are worried about your rights. Some of you are worried about political things. Some of you are worried about racial tensions. I understand that. And those are okay to be worried about some of those things. But when it's the thing that burns in our heart more than Jesus burns in our heart worries me worries me about the church are we unified in the mission of the gospel are we worried about people they're going to spend eternity without jesus without king jesus because we're not willing to open our mouths and proclaim the good news that's happened to us the book of revelation is a unifying book to the church it's a clarifying of the mission of the church. If you are a follower of Jesus, you need to keep him on the throne. You need to keep him on the throne. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 12. I turned around to see a voice that was speaking to me. He turns around and he, he looks at Jesus. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. That's the churches. That's the seven churches. And among the lampstand was someone like the Son of Man. This is from the book of Daniel. And Jesus called himself the Son of Man when he walked on earth. And what Jesus was saying is, is that he is the fulfillment of this Old Testament prophecy. Uh, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. So we think royalty, right? Beautiful. The hair on his head was white like wool and white as snow. Jesus has white hair, not brown. I guess he didn't dye it in heaven, right? So if you have white hair, um, you're like Jesus, I guess, right? White hair in the scripture is, is, is a symbol of wisdom. It's a symbol of wisdom. Jesus knows everything. He's an expert on everything. He's brilliant. The white hair means he knows, and you can ask him advice about anything. This is King Jesus. And his eyes were like blazing fire. Jesus doesn't just look at you. He looks in you. He looks in you. Deuteronomy uh, 4.24 says, This is the Lord your God, is a consuming fire, a jealous God. The eyes of Jesus were like, like this blazing fire as he looked over the seven churches. Nothing escaped his penetrating glare. He could see every good deed and every bad deed. Jesus doesn't just look at us he has the ability to see all the things in us. All the good, all the bad, all the good thoughts, all the bad thoughts. And what does the fire do? It purifies us. Jesus doesn't just look at us. He looks in us. Jesus knows everything about you. Jesus knows you better than you know yourself. That's crazy, right? Verse 15, it says, His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. 
The strongest metal of the time uh, was iron. But the, the longest lasting metal of the time was copper. Uh, bronze is the, the strongest and the, and the longest lasting um, metal is copper. You mix those things together and you get this bronze. And so what Jesus is saying is Jesus' foundation is, is the strongest and the longest lasting. Notice it doesn't say that he's wearing this. It is who he is. What he's saying is Jesus' foundation is strong and it will last forever and ever and ever, ever. And his voice, it says, was like a sound of a rushing water. It wasn't a little whisper. It wasn't a little whisper. No, it was when Jesus speaks, his voice it, 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 in the physical realm, it's not a whisper. It's like rushing water, many waters converging together, and that sound, and it roars. When Jesus returns and he speaks into the physical realm on this earth, the very earth will quake. This voice, this is the voice that spoke the very world into existence. This is the voice um, that will raise, think about this. This is what the Bible promises that in, in Jesus' second coming, that, that Jesus is going to call out to the grave. And those who are in Christ, their bodies will rise. He's going to call out, and it's going to rumble the grave so much that those who were dead or fell asleep are going to meet him in the sky first. And then those of us who are alive, we get second. We get there, we get there a little bit later, right? This is the voice who has authority over all creation. It's not a whisper. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and the coming of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. The seven stars, um, the translation here is angels. So it could mean, um, remember, angels are just messengers. That's all they are. That's what it means in the scripture. It just means messenger. It could mean heavenly beings were with him. They're like these heavenly beings. It also could mean um, that it was the seven pastors, messengers, of those seven churches. Um, I'm not sure it really matters. Um, what we know is um, that Jesus is holding the message in his hand. The message is in his hand. If you look at the text, it says his right hand held the seven stars. In essence, the message is in his very hand. From his mouth was a, a, a sharp double-edged sword. This is, and this one's a little bit easier. This is, means uh, what, is, what is he's speaking is the word of God. It's the, it's the word of God coming out. The scriptures um, tell, tell us that uh, it is like a, a double-edged sword or a two-edged sword, it represents the, the Bible. And have you ever been in that moment where you're reading the scripture or you hear it from somebody or, or someone speaks the word of God into your life and you go, ow, that just hurt. Like that hurt me, Shrek, that cut me, right? That cut to my very soul, right? Have you ever had that? It penetrates and, and, and it moves in us, and, 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 and it, it, it does something to us. It goes into our thoughts and our attitudes, into our very hearts, and it changes us. So what this is saying is from Jesus' mouth, the word of God is, going to come, is coming to us. It's going to penetrate us. When God speaks... Um, we have a couple of choices. One is submission and obedience. That's the best one. Just to let you know that. The other is ignorance and, and live in ignorance and disobedience. Anytime God speaks to us, whether it feels good or bad, it's ultimately for our good. Let you remember that. It's always for our good. Hey, Levi, I don't want you to do that. I want to. No, it's not going to be for your good. Sally, no, 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 don't do that. Don't say it like that. No. It's for your good. It's not 
It's always for our good, because God loves us like kids. His face was like the sh sun shining in all its brilliance. When we get to heaven, there is no electricity bill. Can you imagine that, right? Up here, that's, that's like glorious. So you, can I get an amen on that, right? Like we have the second highest electricity, I think, cost in America um, here in, in heaven. Jesus' glory will light the city up. It'll light the city up. There'll be no more lights. It's like Jesus illuminates the whole city. It's like we're living in Alaska in the summertime all the time. Because Jesus is the light of the world. So John says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. This is a proper response. Very proper response to that kind of power. This is a different picture of Jesus, isn't it? Look what it says, though, in this next verse. Verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. The right hand is a, it's a symbol of friendship. This is King Jesus. This is powerful Jesus. This is creator Jesus. This is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He puts his right hand onto his friend and he says to him, do not be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. I was dead and now look, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and AIDS. King Jesus saying, I'm the living one. I, I was dead, but now I'm alive forever and ever. He's risen from the dead, church. Amen? Yeah. And he will never die again. He never has to go to the cross again. His crucifixion will not be repeated. He holds the keys. He's in total control of death. Total control of death and hell. He conquered both by rising from the dead. So John, um, he tells him, hey, you don't need to be afraid. You don't need to be afraid, my friend. You don't need to be afraid of death. You don't need to be afraid of hell. You don't need to be afraid of any of that stuff. I'm the beginning and I'm the end and, I'm, and we're friends. Why are people so afraid when they read the book of Revelation? It's a book of comfort. Don't be afraid. Jesus removed the sting of death for us. He removed hell for us, which we all deserved, both of those. This is a story of hope. Almighty God giving his life for us, rising from the dead. Someday he's going to return. He's going to make all things right. He's going to turn, return in all his splendor, in all his glory. And he's going to, for those who have said yes to Jesus, this is what he's going to do. He's going to extend his right hand to you. This is what you need to remember as we go through this, and this is what you need to remember this week. There's one question that we all have to answer. Where are you with Jesus? Where are you? you with Jesus. This is the most important question of your life right now. It's the most important, <coughs> excuse me, most important question tomorrow in your life. Where are you with Jesus? It changes things. You know, we should do more praying and less worrying. We should do more praying and less politicking. We should do more praying and be less paranoid. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus and this question, where are you with him? He's coming again. It's the end of the world as we know it. But if you've said yes to Jesus, you have hope. Father, we thank you for who you are. We ask that we would know 
we would know you in a deeper way today. That our lives would just be given as living sacrifices to you. That we would walk with you. That we would walk in this hope that you've given us. That you are good. And that everything that you say is for our good. That we would believe that. God, give us faith to believe that. God, we ask. I ask for those who have not said yes to Jesus yet. That they would go, yes, I I need a Savior. I recognize what you did on the cross for me. And I need Jesus. I want to have that hope whether I I, I live tomorrow, whether I die tomorrow, tomorrow, or, or whether you come back tomorrow or not. God, I want to pray for the church right now, that we would be on mission. God, we're in uncertain times. You know this. This isn't a shock to you. God, I pray that the church would be the church and that we would continue to proclaim the good news of Jesus. That it would be the thing that burns in our heart more than anything else. That people don't know you yet. And they have this opportunity to. But your word says, how will they know if they've never heard? How will they respond if they've never heard? God, let us be be messengers of, of your good news. Let it be good news to all people. A Savior was born. He lived. He died and he rose again and he is, he is on the throne. Thank you, King Jesus, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Please stand and join us for our final song.
Church, let's close with these words from Jesus found in Revelation chapter 22. Behold, I'm coming soon. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy in this book. And all God's people said.